Thank you, Anna, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. This morning, we're looking forward to talking with current and former leaders who are enhancing our nation's abilities to protect and respond to WMD threats through countermeasures, operations, intelligence, and preparedness. Today, we'll discuss some of the biggest priorities for national security leaders to ensure safety both at home and abroad. We'll also hear about historical CWMD efforts, lessons learned, and how the national security community is positioning itself to combat future threats and challenges. When Secretary Nielsen announced the establishment of DHS's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office this past December, she emphasized the importance of consolidating key DHS functions focused on the department's efforts to counter WMD threats. As the danger from terrorist groups and rogue nation states continues to evolve, we must have an integrated approach that brings together intelligence, operations, interagency coordination, and international engagement. Just last week, Secretary Nielsen described the major challenges to our threat landscape and how man-made threats and our resilience in the face of these threats define the way forward for the department. At Noblis, these issues are very important to us because we know that collaboration, agility, and innovation are the keys to safeguarding our nature's future and mitigating the risk of attacks. We're proud of our over 20-year history as a partner in the Homeland Security Mission, and we are so pleased to host today's event. And now it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage our keynote speaker, Mr. James McDonald, Assistant Secretary of the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office at the Department of Homeland Security to kick off the discussion this morning. Mr. McDonald is a well-recognized expert in the area of WMD-related terrorism. His distinguished career has included senior executive service in the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Energy, and the White House. In May, he was appointed by President Trump to serve as the Assistant Secretary for the Department of Homeland Security's newly established Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office. Mr. McDonald, thank you and welcome for joining us today. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's always, it's always way better going first than right after lunch when everybody's nodding off. Um, so I'll just start out with tell you everything's fine. Uh, nothing to worry about. There's, we got it all under control. We are the federal government, and we're, we're here to help. Um, so actually, I want to acknowledge Dr. Gwadia first. Um, I got appointed in to uh, be the director of DNDO before actually three days before I to was told we were going to do this reorganization. And uh, um, I was just explaining to somebody, when you, th when you think about uh, weapons of mass destruction and sort of the processes that, that we're going through, I got a group together real early on, the DN on the DNDO side, a group called PAD, which is a product acquisition folks. And I said, there was about 50 of them in a the room. And I said, okay, how many people in here are nuclear experts? And about four people raised their hand. And I said, okay. So I got a really, really awesome acquisition program. They get, can do requirements generation, mission analysis, evaluate technologies. And only four of them are nuke specialists. So if I take four bio people and four chem people and put them in that same room, now I've got an exceptional acquisition shop that can do chem nuke bio. And that's sort of the path we're going down. The, the two organizations that got merged, there's some cats and dogs stuff from, from other headquarters, some staff from policy and ops, but, but functionally, the Office of Health Affairs and DNDO were the ones that were merged. Um, when DNDO was stood up, it had an what I call an exquisite set of authorities. Um, the DNDO director, uh, there's only three people in the Homeland Security Department that have statutory R&D authorities, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, the DNDO Director, and S&T, where uh, I won't compare us to the Coast Guard because they're a little bigger. Um, but what DNDO can do that S&T can't do, and this is not a knock on S&T, it's just the way it got structured, S&T stops at TRL-7. So they have a hard time getting from an R&D development project, sort of rapid prototyping, things like that, and across what I call the technology valley of death. So you can bring a project along, but then it stops because it doesn't have a customer at the tail end of it. When DNDO got established and, and the way it operated, it, it has that entire pipeline all the way through life cycle sustainment, 
So there's a program of record very early in a project, and, and that follows it all the way through uh, fruition. Also, what uh, DNDO did, which was, uh, was pretty brilliant, is actually has the acquisition dollars to field what they develop. So it's, it's a pretty unique organization, and uh, it's going to cease to exist, but it, it is the basis for CWMD. Now, on the other side of the house, on the OHA side, um, what OHA really brought to the table was a cadre of expertise in the ChemBio space. So Mark Kirk, uh, where you, raise your hand. So Dr. Mark Kirk over here is probably one of the, the preeminent experts in the country on chemical toxicology and, and chemical threats. Um, him integrating into the bigger DNDO structure and in, in the business processes brings a talent that you know, the acquisition guys can look at them, talk to them, talk about, like, we just did a training program in response to a threat that Mark championed and led, but we had a rapid acquisition that was done, that was done by folks that were procurement folks over on the DNDO side of the house. A training program was developed, and that was cooperate, cooperatively with Mark, his folks, some of the training and readiness folks from the DNDO side, and Fletzi. So we reached out to different parts of the department. Now that's about to transition to the Center for Domestic Preparedness down in Anniston, so it'll be a nationalized program, and the headquarters will be out of the provide the training business, and it'll get handed off to a training institution to, to, to push out. So what we're, what we're doing, um, and the reason I wanted to give uh, Dr. Guardi a shout out, is the, the toolkit is there to be able to do really good stuff. Um, there's a lot of support from the secretary, uh, the House. Uh, I talked to Chairman McCall yesterday, last evening. The House passed the CWMD bill yesterday afternoon. So now it's just got one more step to get through uh, Chairman Johnson's committee. And that, that looks really positive. And the, the strategy behind that is the authorities that were given to DNDO will apply across WMD. So the ability to do grants and do cooperative agreements and international uh, programs and things like that will apply to the whole WMD space. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, so let me say one other thing. So I was, I was going to your conferences, you, you copied our name, which is sort of, that's very nice. Um, but uh, a year ago, the, or two years ago now, I guess the discussion was a CBRNE organization within DHS. And when uh, I got tasked with doing the, doing the merger, that sounded to me a little more like a list of materials than it did a mission. And I think countering WMD is, is a clearly defined mission. Now, what does that mean? Um, it's not just buy gear. It's understanding what to buy, where it should be. Um, DNDO also did uh, what's called the Global Nuclear Detection Architecture which I think is probably one of the best pathway analyses I've ever seen in looking literally at the globe and all the different ways that illicit material could be moved, the, the mode of movement, the, where you might encounter it. So it provides a nice baseline to say, okay, uh, for example, a train coming across the border, um, is it rail, is it passenger? It's been assessed to see how well we are at being able to detect something coming through that, that mission area or that that locality. Um, I'm not going to tell you how well we can or not, but we, we really have a lot of fidelity in that analysis. And so the, the challenge now for us is to look at sort of how does that geographic laydown look and what are the pathways that we can get out and focus on interdiction. Um, a couple of sort of administrative points. When we set the organization up, so I'm a political appointee. I think I'm the right guy for the job right now. Um, but my, my replacement could be a speechwriter. I mean, it's, it's a political job. You, sometimes, sometimes you get a technical or operational person. Sometimes you get literally somebody that was a VP speechwriter. I mean, you just never know. So we thought the number two position was probably the most critical position in the organization. And uh, the way we set that up is the principal deputy assistant secretary is a rotator from one of the operating components. So it was Dave Flutie, who was a CBP. Uh, senior executive, and it's now an ICE counterproliferation investigator who just came from being the SAC in Baltimore. The plan is in about two years it'll be a Coast Guard Admiral, then it'll cycle back to CBP. Now what that'll do is that'll make sure that the organization has stability, 
with senior career people, but also the top person will be somebody who is an operator and is going back to an operational component. So it'll keep the focus on supporting the operators. Um, the uh, So we have, over the years, we've deployed about 60,000 detectors in the continental United States through various programs back to Nunn Luger in uh, 1996. Um, they, there's been a sort of continuous push of different types of detection systems, ranging from little pagers that were first made out in Santa Barbara to uh, radiation portals. But the, over the years, there's, there's been sort of a change in the, the keeping track of that stuff. There's been nobody that's really been on the hook to, to keep track of what was bought through, DA, through grant funds back from ODP days, now FEMA. Um, we know what DNDO has purchased and put in ports and, and with the Coast Guard and others, but what we don't know is what's the status of all that other, other gear out there. So one of the things we did is, uh, it's just finishing up now, is we're doing a domestic nuclear detection con ops that integrates everything from state and local through federal. And we're, we're starting down the road of looking at what's all the rest of that gear out there and is it time to retrofit it, upgrade it, what's the training standards that should be behind it, those types of things. So that's, that's a per pretty big project and that'll, that'll be going on for a couple of years. Um, the, the other thing that we're doing and, and this, so the gear that's out there, um, before, I, before I checked into DNDO, uh, they had started a project, uh, a tech transfer project from uh, DARPA called um, Sigma. Um, now, Sigma is an approach, so whether Sigma ends up being the solution or not is, is yet to be seen. But the concept is very simple in that detectors can leverage smartphone technology and other enhanced communications technologies and do real-time streaming or data bursts, whatever, whatever the operational environment makes sense where you can get an actual visual of what's going on in the field. Um, one of the things that concerns me a little bit is uh, in, in the ports, uh, the RPM program, um, we detect, they alert a couple of million times a year with radi radioactive material in a container that should be there. It gets cleared, it's part of commerce, and it goes out into town. But we don't hear anything about it after that. So. You know, all those state and local guys that are walking around with detectors, you know, I would think at some point one of those containers, somebody would be calling into our place going, hey, we've got a container that's emitting radiation. And that's not really happening. So that, to me, is an indicator that there's, there's something going on out there. Either it's really efficient self-adjudication or people aren't detecting stuff that, that's moving around as much as we think they are. Um, so as we figure out who's got what gear. The Sigma approach, which is streaming data, will make a really big difference going forward because as we retrofit equipment or replace it, it will all be live and the GNDA will stop being just a pathway analysis and it'll actually be a live system that the, the information is being communicated. Um, we're integrating into the CBP National Targeting Center to do this. Uh, because it's a it's a big data analytics facility. It's got a uh, big backbone, and it's very well integrated with DoD, with JIDO, DITRA, and uh, some of the SOCOM big data analytics. So when you start looking at understanding where where equipment is, what what it's seeing, now you start being able to have another layer of data to be able to to do targeting. Um, one one approach that we're taking. So we've got a thing that we've developed that's called the CWMD information architecture, and it's, it's sort of it's a big chart, and it's to try to it identifies all the nodes where collection is happening, and then it identifies where the big data analytics capability is, and so we've got a team that's looking at how that's going to integrate. So you got to you got to look at every single one of those different nodes and say what. What is the information I want to communicate? How am I going to communicate it? How am I going to deconflict it, protect it, build a, a cyber strat cybersecurity strategy into it as we do it? But the goal is to literally have a global detection architecture that is real-time data that's coming in that can be analyzed and can be overlaid on other targeting data that's out there. Um, 
for example, we know where there are special interest alien smuggling networks, right? Um, part of the plan, when I was a young guy in the military, I used to go into Central and South America and put little seismic sensors in airfields, and a plane would land, they'd load up with drugs, and it'd take off, and somebody would get a signal, and they'd go interdict the aircraft. Um, we, we're going to go down that road in a similar way. We know where we have uh, TCOs, trans transnational criminal organizations operating, special interest alien migration pathways. And so we're looking at working with uh, our partners in government, uh, in DOD, uh, I mentioned ICE, HSI, they're uh, in about 80 locations overseas. We have, we have a pretty big footprint. TSA has uh, capabilities, uh, CBP, we're doing uh, screening overseas. So instead of waiting to get to the border, starting to put sensor arrays out into the areas where we think bad guys are operating. Now, one of the nice things that's going to happen, that's actually already happening, is because of the way the authorities are, are being aligned, what I said was sensor arrays, I didn't say gamma detectors, right? Um, what we're going to do is go down the path of saying, in this operational environment, what is the data that we should be collecting? What are the best sensors to be there, given what we're looking for? Uh, you start overlaying things like thermal imagery, LIDAR, multispectral. I mean, whatever makes sense is what should be in the sensor package. And it becomes more WMD-ish. Now, something that was interesting, there's a project that, uh, is there any Brits here? For okay. Um, I was talking to the Brits about a, a pro joint project that DNDO and, and the Home Office have been doing for a while, and uh, our, on our side, the guys are saying, "Ah, we don't, we don't think it's in. It's going to end up fielded," and uh, the Brits are saying, "Well, we really want to field it, and it's because it's really good at, at detect. It, it's, it's very good detection, but it finds tobacco real easy, <laughs> right? And one of their border things is they're concerned about tobacco smuggling." Right, so it was sort of envisioned as a detection system for a rad nuke, but it turned out it's really good for finding other illicit materials being moved. So they're just saying, hey, this, we, got, we have a really good use for this. It's not what we originally thought it was going to be. But when you step back and you think about sensing and sensor arrays from that perspective, it, it doesn't really matter what you're looking for. It matters that you have the tools to be able to say, or sorry, it does matter what you're looking for. It doesn't have to be a cookie gutter approach. So that so the different sensor arrays that are put in place in different locations will be tailored to what the threat is and what the risk is there. Uh, it's important for us to be integrated in with uh, the targeting center at CBP. Um, that could change over time. Um, right now, though, the targeting center is the big data hub that we're lashed up with. Uh, Air Marine also has operation centers, uh, the TSOC, the T TSA operation center. There, there are other capabilities within the department, and this could morph over time. Uh, most folks are going to a cloud-based solution anyway, so I think, you know, where the, where the folks are sitting looking at consoles is probably not the most important thing at the end of the day. It's how the data is coming in, being stored, being analyzed, and being transmitted back out to be relevant to people. Um, I'm going to shift real quick to bio, because um, bio is, a, uh, is, is and has been a problem. I think uh, from a DHS perspective and a lot of the, the push from, from Congress, it's been that uh, bio is probably the reason the office really exists. The, the merge was pushed for a number of years. Um, BioWatch is in the field. Uh, BioWatch was, uh, was a Livermore Sandia project. 20 years ago, um, it's called Basis. It became BioWatch. It got deployed as a result of the anthrax attacks in uh, 2001, and it was what was good at the time. It was what was on the shelf. Um, the con op for for BioWatch is it collects an air sample over a 24-hour period. Somebody takes that filter, goes to a public health laboratory, they do PCR analysis and then they determine if something happened. Now, so since I've taken over, I've sort of been keeping track of what's the timeline look like on these things. And so the average seems to be 11 to 13 hours after a sample gets to a laboratory before a decision is made to, of whether it's an incident or not. Um, so that gives you, you know, up to 39 hours. That's not so good, 37 hours in between samples 
and, and a decision, right? Now, if you take Penn Station in New York, you have 600,000 people a day going through it, 9 million person subway system, four international airports within an hour, and our current con op is yesterday we released smallpox in Penn Station. So you have a global pandemic before we even done do any analysis of, of the threat. Um, you, know, you talk about like what's going on right now in Africa with Ebola, there's a tremendous amount of work doing patient contact monitoring and, and ring vaccination, and it's in a relatively static environment, but it's still a huge deal, and there's still the potential for that breaking out and becoming an epidemic or a, or a pandemic. <clears throat> Mostly in this case because of security concerns in, in the area where, where it was. Six months ago there was an outbreak in a safer part of the Congo and it was contained really well. The World Health Organization, CDC, and, and folks did a great job. But if you think, you know, we're, we're containing something there, if you, if you flip that on its head and say we released something in Penn Station, that now it's, it's literally global. So a big part of what we're doing on the nuke side is really important for being able to do the bio piece. So doing the, the anomaly detection, data analytics, using a system that already exists, which is the nuclear detection architecture, will give us a backbone to be able to do it for bio. Bio is going to be a lot harder. So nuke, I, most people are afraid of nukes. I think they're sort of easy. I've been around them since I was a kid, it feels like now. But, um, you know, it's a binary thing. You either have radiation or you don't, right? And it it penetrates through materials, so there's, by and large, it's, it's an easy problem as long as you have the right equipment and the right training. You, you know that something's emitting or it isn't. Um, bio, uh, what the air looks like in Washington during a cherry blossom festival is a lot different than what the air looks like on a cold, rainy afternoon. Uh, the air in Denver is different than the air in California. Denver has naturally occurring anthrax. California has tularemia. Um, if you're in a train station, you got brake dust, you got it. I mean, there's so many different variables that are going on when you're trying to analyze particulates in the air. Uh, but DOD's done a pretty good job in advancing the technologies to be able to do triggers for identifying anomalies. Now, we're, we're actually in the process right now where BioWatch will continue to operate until it's replaced, but we are not going down a road of enhancing BioWatch. What we're doing is deploying real-time triggers that will do biosensing and identify an anomaly. <clears throat> now, de determining that anomaly is going to be pretty difficult. It's going to take some time and some pretty advanced analytics to, to figure out what's, what's the bell curve really look like for what's normal at what time of day and what location, things like that. There is quite a bit of data out there, but that's going to be a really, really big project for us over the next couple of years. Um, but then the CONOP looks very similar to the nuclear CONOP at the end of the day. Uh, currently, you know, I mentioned BioWatch, you take a filter, they go straight to a public health laboratory. There is no first responder interface. I had guys in Baghdad over 92, 93, digging up anthrax, and we had real-time anthrax assays that were handheld that, that worked. They were pretty expensive, but it's not, not so much expensive anymore. So what we're going to do is a trigger will alert. It'll say, hey, come look at me. And then somebody with handheld kit will go down and do a quick assessment to see if there's positive for anthrax or not. Um, now, you're, now you've gone from, you had smallpox released yesterday to literally in the first 20 or 30 minutes you're doing incident management. And the, the folks that would be managing a, a radiation response or a hazmat spill or any other type of public safety emergency are the guys that are going to be there. They're going to be on scene or they're going to be able to start making decisions. They can say, hey, maybe we ought to keep everybody in Penn Station for a little while. Um, there is portable PCR kits now that, that are in a 15 to 30 minute range that can get a preliminary result. So what, what we see happening is a trigger says, hey, come look at me. Somebody goes and, and looks at it, does an initial assessment. When that's happening, because we're built, we're, we're, we're wiring, so to speak, wireless wiring, the, the nuclear architecture, that data will also flow in. And so HHS will know, FBI will know, NYPD will know, the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative folks, all of that, will all know that, hey, there's an alert going on in, in Penn Station. 
Then when somebody goes in with the handheld kit, that will also be transmitting information. So there'll be real-time situational awareness. The command and control will still be at the state and local level, just like it is for any other incident, but we'll know what's going on. Um, we'll still do the PCR analysis. So Bob Cadillac, who's, the, uh, who's over at HHS, he's the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. He was a JSOC doc when I was on active duty. Um, so we're both old, but we've been friends for a real long time. Um, He's got some critical decisions he's got to make relative to the pharmaceutical stockpile, right? So if, it, if we give him a result that isn't the right one and he puts the wrong pharmaceuticals on a plane, that's a really high-risk decision that if it's the wrong decision, it's really hard to get back, right? So the PCR analysis is something that he's still going to need. Now, the PCR analysis, though, actually only takes about three hours. So if you really start from a trigger, and you say, okay, we really, we've done a handheld test. We're pretty sure we got, you know, actually, if we do a handheld test, if I'm the team leader, and somebody says, yep, it's positive for anthrax, I'm going to say, check again. And the second time they say, yep, it's positive for anthrax, I'm like, okay, we got anthrax. I'm done, right? Now we're doing incident management. But Bob needs to know what pharmaceuticals to send. So that goes to the public health lab. Then they do their three-hour PCNR. And within under four hours from that initial trigger saying, come look at me, he knows what type of what type of pharmaceuticals to, to provide, what kind of advice and guidance to be given to the public health officials at the state and local level, how to how to start managing the incident. Uh, the FBI has the ability that you know they're they're tied in as well. So forensics analysis, those types of things can all be going on very quickly, but it all depends on using the architecture that's been built for for the nuclear side of the house. So. When, when you're talking to, to my folks over the next uh, year or two, or now probably, you're going to be hearing a lot more about big data analytics, um, how to make sense of this. I've, uh, I've met with all the, the big laboratory directors, um, recent, and I just recently had a conference call with them. Um, we are changing some of the things that we're doing. Um, we're, not, uh, we're not using uh, high-end laboratories and... Uh, analytical organizations to do training support and things like that. We're going to be using them to do high-end science and solve these big problems. And how do we take this, what looks like just now, a, a big chart with a bunch of blocks on it and make it real? And how, do, how are we going to transmit the information? How are we going to do the analysis? What are the algorithms that are going to have to be written to make sense for bio? Um, and so, Acquisition-wise, we'll still be buying gear. It'll be a new type of gear because it'll, it'll be gear that has to fit into this, this information architecture. Um, that's already underway. It was underway before I, I showed up. Um, the, the RPM replacement program is, is uh, it's probably five years in the acquisition cycle, but the contracts have been awarded. The next generation RPMs are coming out. And they, they have the, the ability to provide data that's at the fidelity we need for, for this type of a system. Uh, we're going to modify the, uh, the booth for CBP officers, so it's a common operating picture. Where literally, all the data from all the different sensors comes into one, one console, one panel, so they can look at everything overlaid. Um, I, I don't know if anybody has a boat, but I, I, my boat, I have a Raymarine chart plotter. Not, Advertising for Raymarine, but uh, I can I can look at my radar. I can look at my sonar. I look at video. I can look at chart overlays. I have serious weather piped into it. I can overlay that, customize it however I want. Um, that's what we see happening in the booth. Now, what that's going to do is that that machine is talking to the targeting center. So, like currently, if you go into one of the booths at a, at a CBP port and an officer, a truck comes in, the officer writes down a license number on a, on a clipboard, types it into one console, types it into another console, and then it, it queries a database to see if there's any wants or warrants or derogatory information on the, on the driver or the truck. Um, now, at the same time that that person in a booth is having to write the number down and type it in, the, the opportunity for error obviously is pretty high. But we actually have a system that was developed and is deployed on the Jersey Turnpike to scan a license plate at 70 miles an hour, right? So here on our ports, we're, we're not using that technology that the way we can. So 
As I'm looking at the sensor array approach, it's what are all the sensors, are they all integrated, and then how are, how are we gaining information? Um, nuisance alarms is always a challenge when you say, well, we're going to do more sensing. Um, I, I strongly believe that actually more sensing causes less nuisance alarms because you have more pieces of information you can compare. So the smarter the systems, the, more, the less likely that you're going to have a lot of nuisance alarms because you have to have one plus one instead of just a one. Um, so there's going to be a lot going on. The, uh, now, if you're in the hardware business, and I've got a minute 57 seconds left, um, I am not the person to talk to about buying hardware. Um, if you don't know what the Coast Guard needs, then you don't know what I need to supply them with. If you don't know what CBP needs, then you don't know what I need to supply them with. So if you're in sort of the, the, the hardware sales side of the world, think about the operating components in the department. Um, and you should think about CWMD as sort of being a mini DITRA. And uh, Vale Oxford really likes that because he started DNDO. And so by me saying we're a mini DITRA, you know, he, he still feels like he owns us. Um, actually, Vale's a good friend, but it, uh, I didn't actually know that job was available. It's like a half a mile from my house. You know? <laughs> I'm commuting into DC. But, uh, but the interagency relationship is really, really good. Uh, Lisa Gordon Haggerty, who's running NNSA now, actually recruited me out of the military to come to, to Washington 20 years ago. Vail, I mentioned uh, uh, Bob Cadillac, uh, Ken Rapuano, who's the Homeland Defense over at the Pentagon. They're, everybody is working together. It's really a good team, and it's sort of fun right now because it's a lot of folks that know each other. It's an important mission. We're getting a lot of support. A lot of interest, and I think for organizations like yours, it, it should be really exciting because it's moving. It's taken a lot of work that's been done over the years and moving it to the next level and saying, how do we integrate our advanced analytics and computer learning and all those types of things? Um, 26 seconds left, so that's how much I'll talk about chemical. Um, everything I said um, on detection architecture applies to chem. Um, I'm not personally one of those guys that thinks we need a lot of a big, huge architecture of chemical detection systems out there, because unlike bio, you get real-time feedback. Um, if you get, you know, the Amsterdam attack in 1995 is a good example. I mean, you know when people uh, are exposed to it. So, um, it, but the system will allow that if people want it in the, in the operating environment. So we are building it to be able to have chem in there. I just don't see chem deploying the same way uh, right now. But the technology is really mature, so the ability is there. So I am out of time. I just want to say thank you very much for having me this morning. Um, I look forward to seeing a lot of you again. And thanks very much. Thank you.